Body size and approximate size estimates are one of the most contentious subjects in the fossil record. And that's largely due because a lot of the things that we find in the fossil record are pretty partial. Still, that doesn't mean people don't make estimates and make them quite often. Unfortunately, that also leads to some confusion sometimes and also some very aggressive discourse in certain parts of the online paleontology community. Just look at when Dunkleosteus got downsized just a little while ago. There's tons of outcry, oh, it's not as scary anymore, despite it still being a four meter long fish with giant shearing jaws. It should be equally scary, even if it's not 30 feet long anymore. It could still do a number on you. One of the main causes of this issue, though, is that mainly proxy animals are used when we find something. So for example, you're looking at Dunkleosteus and you go, oh, well, it has a big white head for eating meat. It's clearly probably built just like a shark. So let's just scale up its head to the shark. And yeah, okay, cool. We can use different parts of it. Okay, yeah, it must've been 30 feet long. Until Engelman came forward and went, hey, we can actually look at the operculum, a specific part of the back of the head where it helps cover the gills and the orbit where the eye sits. That length is more correlated with overall body length than just general head size. So specifically by lining those up, we could go, hey, actually it's probably closer to 12 feet and that's what Engelman did. The same thing, but almost in reverse happened recently with Megalodon, where the researchers went, okay, based on what we know, it probably wouldn't actually be shaped just like a great white shark. Instead, it probably would have had a longer body form in order to swim long distances more efficiently. You can't just take a photo of a great white shark, put it in Photoshop and go, drag the corner, and that's how big Megalodon must have been. It doesn't work that way because they're fundamentally different animals. Now, these authors aren't saying all models of size aren't perfect. They are saying that some of them aren't great and that we need to understand that they're models and no model is perfect. They're just useful sometimes. And of these, Megalodon is at least some of the times an outlier. Sure, some of the first estimates were saying it's 100 feet long, which no, it wasn't. It was probably closer to something like 15 meters or around 60 feet long, but that's just one example. Figure one from this paper shows this really well with a bunch of original size estimates of different animals, and then the actual sizes are closer to the actual sizes that have been found later. And this tracks with really, really large things like Diplodocus halorum, but also with things like Beazel bufo, which sure, big frog, but not necessarily as massive as it was first estimated to have been. One of the most famous cases of this sizing down is with Leopleurodon, which was in Walking with Dinosaurs. It even eats a dinosaur in that series, and it was said to be 80 feet long, so over 24 meters in length. And then other researchers came in and went, yeah, it was probably closer to like 10 meters, so about 30 feet, maybe a little bit bigger, but, but certainly not a massive behemoth that was 80 feet long. Just not realistic for that organism. The paper goes on to discuss a few more examples in better detail, Megalodon included, but also things like Perucetus, which was said to potentially be heavier than a blue whale, and then it's like, eh, no, it's still like a good whale size, but it's not that heavy, it's not that big. So still, these are large animals, just we need to kind of rein in some of these estimates. And one of the main reasons for that, that this paper talks about, is largely just that, hey, this causes a lot of confusion in the public consciousness. It makes it seem as though scientists and paleontologists are just untrustworthy because they don't know what they're talking about. When in reality, it's oftentimes paleontologists are just working from limited data. And rather than trying to find specific correlates for those parts of data, there's not really that kind of work being done. Think about it with the fish Dunkleosteus. As I mentioned before, you can look at the orbit to operculum length. And sure, that's great for estimating size, but why would anyone else who's studying modern fish do that kind of thing? They're not looking for total lengths of fish based off just a few skull bones because if you're studying modern fish, you have the entire fish. It doesn't make sense to try and find some other thing that correlates to it when you can just take a tape measure and get the whole thing all at once. However, when we're looking at the fossil record, again, we have less material. So finding these kind of correlations is really important and it's a lot more important to kind of do those things as opposed to just trying to go, eh, yeah, we're just going to Again, just drag the corner of a photo and go, yeah, that lines up, cool, it was this big. You need to find more specific evidence. In the supplemental material, the authors also really helped to make this point that it's not just modern researchers that are overestimating the sizes, it's a persistent issue that has existed in the fossil record. And the main reason this has existed in the fossil record is just because techniques weren't there that were quite the same. Look at Helicoprion, a close relative of sharks that had this weird circular jaw, and we finally found one with a bit of the cartilage from the skull preserved. And the first estimates were, wow, this thing was 30, 35 feet long, pushing, again, 10 to 11 meters. 
More recent research has reduced that size down to about 25 meters, or around 7 meters. And that sounds like a big gap, but the important thing that actually changed that is the methods. Because instead of just looking at this block that had some of the cartilage in it, they actually CT scanned that block and were able to see where that cartilage actually ended, at least internal to the rock, as opposed to it going all the way through it. And from that they went, okay, yeah, this thing wasn't as big. New technologies and new methods are helping us to better understand animal sizes. And this goes back as far as Tyrannosaurus rex, where initially it was described as being 50 feet long, over 15 meters in length. And then further research happened and people went, actually it's probably closer to 13 meters, or around 40 feet in length. And the big part of that is because when you're thinking about these really old fossils of dinosaurs, again, Tyrannosaurus rex was founded 1905, so it's an old animal as far as our knowledge of it, it was initially suggested to have stood upright, with its tail dragging on the ground. As evidence came out that dinosaurs didn't drag their tails, it was put in a more horizontal posture. And from that, the researchers went, hey, this tail is really oddly proportioned if it's 50 feet long, so let's reduce that. And we can see that with more fossils that were found, but that is a much more appropriate length for Tyrannosaurus rex. This is just to say that the animals of yesteryear and then in the fossil record aren't necessarily the massive giants we expect. Some of them would have been much closer to modern day animal sizes, and that makes sense. And that's not to say all of them were. Many of them were still giants. Again, Tyrannosaurus rex is pushing 11, 12 meters long. It's a big animal. It's dead, but it's a big animal, or it was a big animal. Those are still really important things to understand, though, when we're trying to understand their ecology. Because the difference between an animal that is that extra 10 feet longer in Tyrannosaurus rex, they're going to have entirely different metabolisms. And the larger one is going to have a much higher metabolism than the smaller one and that would have impacts on how it would have fed and what kind of foods it may have been targeting. So by better understanding this, we can try and hopefully understand the fossil record as a whole and fossil ecologies better. And then again, there's the whole misinformation thing where, oh look, paleontologists don't know what they're talking about. We do, it's just sometimes we need to take a second look and sometimes we need better methods like CT scanning.